Well done. Electronic Bibles, can I see those? Outstanding. Outstanding. Having a month long to deal with deliverance can seem like a lot. But I've found the following. First, so many that need it are so inconsistent in their attendance that if I didn't have a full month of it, they'd get none of it. Secondly, so many that do attend regularly feel deliverance is for everybody else that's here more than it is for them. And so they are present and available to receive, but consistently do not because of some spiritual narcissism where they feel like they don't need it. You know how many people I've had that I've had the opportunity to minister to, and they'll tell me, man, I'm fine. Me and Jesus, we're great. Holy Spirit's flowing. I speak in tongues daily. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I said, well, let's just pray this prayer. Halfway through the prayer, they start manifesting. And I want to stop right there and say, what were you? But I can't do that. You know what I'm saying? I just have to say, okay, hey, wow. <laughs> Praise God we found that. That's, that's, that's marvelous. <laughs> Thirdly, there are some that will come just to see. Some will come and treat a session like this like some go to Frontier City to catch the haunted house. I just want to, I just want to experience. I just, I just want to see what's up. I want to see for myself if it's really real. Fourthly, many wait patiently, or not, for me to hit the mark of their issue or issues, however that may be, or to discern prophetically what it is that they need. When you're talking about deliverance, guys, I'm talking about a pamphlet that thick of just different areas. That the, en the enemy doesn't just come with one, two, or three, right? There's all kinds of combinations and, and weird stuff. And your issue may not be your neighbor's issue, although it might be. Um, and if you're waiting all month, it is possible that the subject of deliverance and what we can get set free from is so large that I can preach a different message as I'm attempting to do every time we get together throughout the month of October and still at the end of the month miss your particular issue. So when that happens, I'm asking you not to wait till the end of the month, okay? When we get to the altar portion and I pray for you, if we didn't deal with what's going on, listen, you don't know what might happen. You don't know if I'm going to be detained or you're going to be detained or you, you, we don't know what's going to happen, right? And you think, well, I got the rest of the month. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, okay? This life is a little bit unexpected, okay? So if, if, if you feel that ministry, like right now, I, I like to walk up and down the aisles, um, it's not so great from the camera on a Thursday night because we have a lot of empty seats and the camera seems to focus on the empty chair sometimes. But because you guys like to hang out at the back. Um, but there's times where I'll walk by people and they, they start feeling funny, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've had them where arms have gone numb. Uh, they get frozen. Uh, they start shaking. Uh, eyes divert. They can't look. You know, just weird stuff. Can't talk. I, I've lost count how many times that I've, I've walked by somebody or, or prayed for somebody, touched somebody, and literally say, say this after me, and they just look at me like, I said, no, really, say this. And the, fir the first two or three times that happened, I was getting frustrated. I was like, listen, man, I don't got to be here. Why don't you talk? And it dawned, oh, this isn't them. I'm serious. And so, Sometimes even in ministry, as I'm walking through, you may feel some stuff stirred up and things get a little lively in your life and body. And because I didn't hit the subject that you feel like you needed, 
you just say, well, we'll deal with it another time. No. If you get stirred up or spun up, you need to come tell me, and let's address it so you don't have to go home with it. Let me tell you another reason why you don't want to go home with something after I've hacked it off. <laughs> because there's typically hell to pay when you go home. Inevitably, you're going to get a loan, whether in bed or in the shower or whatnot, and the enemy will find you and say, remember that night you took me into that church and messed with me and all that stuff? Well, I'm going to make sure you understand we don't want to do that again. Does that make sense? Some of y'all looking at me real holy all of a sudden. So let me tell you my goal. My goal is... To not treat this subject as a novelty or something that's rare. I missed most of, most of worship tonight because I was in my office doing what I'm about to teach. This is, this is an almost, if not everyday, occurrence for me. I want to demystify what it is and how it works because there's a lot of people that want to make it so glamorous and so holy that, that man, you, you, you just best not step into this. I'm going to tell you, if you don't step into this, it will step into you, and I'd whole lot rather you approach it than it approach you. Does that make sense? Another personal goal that I have in all of this is I want to bring clarity to how the enemy works and gains access in your life. I need you to understand how that works so that you can stop it. I also want to teach and demonstrate authority. Authority is another one of those things that we like to go, we have authority in Jesus' name. Yes, we do. We have authority in the Word of God. Absolutely. Yes, we do. And it's like, okay, but how do you invoke the name and how do you use the Word? And I've had a lot of people, I mean, especially when I was a youth pastor, they'd call me in their bedroom under the covers with a Bible over their chest, call me on the phone saying, here's what stuff happening in my house. <laughs> this will not protect you in this form. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, ha it has to be digested so that what's in here is eaten becomes one with, with you or me in this instance so that when I say it, I'm speaking something that I'm one with. Y'all ain't grabbing any of this right now. So what we like to do is we like to just, well, God says you better blah, blah. Okay? If that's all you got, I mean, use what you got. But we have to learn how to make the word a part of us. I want to give practical instructions so that everybody can function in self-deliverance. When you learn what you're about to learn tonight, please don't run over to your neighbor or family member and go, let me just try this. In the mighty name of Jesus, quit messing with everybody else's devils and deal with your own. Go to the bathroom and look yourself in the mirror. <laughs> if you can't deal with your own demons, please don't come mess with mine. I also want to assist you in identifying signs and symptoms of the enemy. In fact, unless the Lord changes my mind, I'm going to be, I'm going to use a message I've used before, 14 signs you might have a devil. I love that message. 14 signs you might have a devil. And lastly, I want to give opportunity for all to participate so that you can experience instead of just only knowing principles. Principles are good. But if you don't know how to act on a principle, is it really that good? So all you that have Bibles, I saw you holding them in, in the air. You can start with Matthew chapter 28.
verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, what's the therefore? Therefore, it's based on the fact that Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. And he's saying, because I have all the authority, now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Stop. Be strong in whom? Got too many people trying to be strong in me. So be strong in the Lord and what? In the power of his might. Got too many believers trying to show how much might they have. Can I just, here's what, here's what I need you to grasp. When I'm dealing, especially in deliverance, and I get in somebody's face, and I'm seeing that devil look back at me, I don't need them to see me. I need to be invisible. You guys remember Star Trek being cloaked, right? I want to go into cloak mode. I don't need the devil to see me. I need the devil to see greater is he that's in me. I need the enemy in you to see the Holy Spirit in me. You want to be like the seven sons of Sceva, try to make your name known in deliverance. Well, don't you know who I am? <laughs> you ain't nothing. Nothing. Zero. Unless your sack of dirt is inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God. You catch what I'm saying? Paul said, I only preach Jesus and him crucified. Paul didn't come to the devil saying, I address you by the name of Paul. We come in the power and the authority that belongs to him. And if it belongs to him, I don't have to put my name on it. I get to use it. Now, I don't know what the most popular tools are today. I think Snap-on is still kind of up there. Blue Point is kind of, you know, a little bit less than. I, I have seen some new, some, new, uh, uh, some new coming from Harbor Freight that have outperformed Snap-on, but I'll leave that for another day. Um, I'm just saying whenever you pull a craftsman or whatever wrench out of the tool chest, you are not Snap-on. You are using a snap-on wrench, but you are not snap-on. So when you come up to that rusty bolt on that ridiculously worn-out alternator, you don't walk up to it and say, hey, bolt, look at me. It's not about you. You get to use a snap-on wrench to break that thing loose. We get to use the name, the blood, the word, the anointing. It's not about who's holding it. It's about what's being used. 2 Corinthians 10.4. 2 Corinthians 10.4. For the weapons of our warfare. Stop. Most people today don't even understand that they're in a war. In fact, they think that if they can just go to work, be at peace, come home, not have any fights or blowouts, go to sleep, get up, and repeat, then they're not at war. You know all that's been happening in Israel, and I'm not going to get political, but I'm going I'm to make this point. With all that's been happening in Israel, do you understand how long Hezbollah... Hamas, and all the other ones that I don't remember their names right now. Do you understand how long they had to dig those tunnels? We ain't talking trenches. Underground tunnels. Do you understand how long they had to dig those to prepare to make that single attack? Probably decades. So you're, for, for decades, Israel's been at peace. No problems. 
And then all of a sudden, boom, and you got believers saying the same thing. I don't know what I did. I'm not sure what's going on. I do. The devil's been studying you, planning for you, building trenches in your life and your family and your job and all the stuff that you have access to. He's been plotting against you for decades to try to destroy you in one fell swoop. So because you're not in a constant day-to-day fight, which we should be, i got to say it like this. I don't just fight when the devil comes at me. Now, my dad taught me, he said, listen, son, I'm not advocating that you get out there and fight. He said, I'm just telling you that if somebody starts a fight, make sure you finish it. That's how I feel about, the, about people. That's not how I feel about the enemy. Okay? So if the enemy has not brought a fight to me this morning, by the end of the day, I must needs have brought a fight to him. Y'all, you, you got to catch this. I, I have to be fighting at some point throughout the day. Either he's going to bring it or I'm going to bring it, but we're interfacing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because why? We are at war. Why have weapons of war if a war is not our thing? And that's why so many churches are filled with cheerleaders instead of people that are people of war. And that's why some of you get so angry and so upset and so frightened. Well, I've been praying about that for years and ain't nothing ever happened that I prayed for. You want to know why? Because when you come against the devil or the devil comes against you, he doesn't see no blood, he don't smell no blood, he don't sense no Holy Spirit. Why? Because all you got is, is, is a written word that's on your mantle collecting all kinds of dust. You've never figured out how to operate it. Do you understand having a gun in your house will not keep bad guys away? You can't just go down to the pawn shop or the gun shop and, I got me a gun. Bad guys better stay away from my house because the gun sleeps here. How stupid is that? You've never, you don't know how to load it. You don't know what ammo goes in it. You don't understand what kind of kick there is. You don't understand how to cock it. You don't understand how to clean it, oil it, lube it. Nothing. But you bought it. And that's how, that's how the devil sees most believers. Oh, look, isn't it cute? They, bought, they got them a sword. How cute. The most powerful sword there is. But if you don't know how to swing it, thrust it. I know people that got 25 Bibles in their house. Ain't reading a single one of them, but they got them in every room they own. Why? Well, they just think they're just the presence of the Bible. It's not the presence of the Bible. It's the presence of the author of the Bible. And he likes to show up not when the Bible is getting layers of dust. He likes to show up where the Bible is actually being read and discussed and studied and quoted and, and, and recited, ingested. i got to get off page two. I love it when Christians tell me, oh, I have no problems. Well, the first one you got is, you're a liar. <laughs> Let's start with that. Strongholds are a place in the Greek that means a place of strength, a place that's inherently strong. How many of you have habits that you would be very grateful to the Lord if I did not broadcast on the screen right now? You got habits that you're not particularly proud of, but they're habits nonetheless. Listen, do you know they're bad? Yes. Do you know that you ought not to be doing them? Yes. But do you find yourself doing them nonetheless? Yes. Thus we call them a habit. How is it that people that are saved by Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost, walk in power, have an anointing, are ensnared by old habits? How does that happen? Because when you said yes to Jesus, your spirit man got saved, but your flesh has a very, it has short-term memory loss. 
And you have to remind your flesh every morning when you get up, hey, stupid, you can't do what you did the other day. You saved today. You understand what I'm saying? You were saved because you got to remind your flesh because it just goes, okay, and then forgets. So it's up to the spirit man to be in charge. The spirit man has got to be the adult in the room. You hear what I'm saying? Many believers, many Christians have allowed the devil to establish such a stronghold in their hearts, in their minds, and in their lives. If you're a woman, wave at me. You need to be present for Rachel's teaching on the battlefield of the mind. Don't show up, eat, and sleep through the sessions. You need to pay attention, take great notes. We have, to, we have to rule every aspect of our being. Spirit, soul, and body. Intellect. See, when the enemy finds an unclean place in a person's heart, he has the legal right to build a stronghold there. Did you know the believers can have an unclean part of their life? Isn't it amazing when we get to church, believers get an instant denial. Well, I don't, I don't have that in Jesus' name. That is not my problem. It's the problem all the other six days of the week, but you walk in the doors of the church and miraculously it's no longer your problem? I want you to say this in your own mind. You already know what it is. What's the unclean parts of your life what's the places you refuse to go in there and clean or give God the key to so he can clean have you ever had people that wanted to come over to your house but you knew your house was a wreck huh so you told them it's not that you're unwelcome but don't come Huh? Why? Because you knew your house was a wreck. How in the world do you come to church with your house a wreck and try to hide it? You ain't cleaned. You ain't disinfected. You ain't done nothing. So what do you do? Oh, somebody's coming in here. So you go find the cheap 99 cent spray can from Walmart of floral print. That's like some of y'all going home smoking weed, all kinds of stuff, and you come to church and you think that because you're eating a breath mint or chewing some strong gum, that I ain't going to. Now, now you just got weed gum. You know what I'm saying? Now you just got weed and peppermint. You think you're hiding stuff and you're not. How must God feel when we come to his house? And pretend like we don't have any issues. As long as we draw breath in this stratosphere, we will have things that we have to conquer and win and control. Here's a better definition. A stronghold is an uncommitted part of our life. It's uncommitted to Jesus. Try being married and say, honey, you got access to 85% of all that I say and do. But that 15% is just none of your business. Yeah, if you really do have that conversation, my, my docket will be filled next week. Huh? And so when you come to Jesus and you're saying, I want you to be the Lord and master over every area of my life, except that, leave that one alone. Watch this. How many's ever heard it said, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all? Yet we want the lordship of Jesus in the areas that we've submitted to him 
We just want to have complete lordship in those areas and watch this and give lordship to the enemy in these areas. And we think as long as they're in separate rooms, then we'll be okay. The problem is we're not okay because we pay the price for allowing that nonsense in our house. And God in his wisdom will let it happen for a season just to kicks our rear end enough that we'll cry out to him for help. A stronghold is an area of our life that we think we can manage better than God can. A stronghold is an area of our life where we think that we know better. Here's one. Child rearing. I know what to do. I know what to say. I'll be the first to tell you I don't know, and I've messed it up a bunch. It's God's grace that our kids have turned out as awesome as they have. How about relationships? Got married. What do I need to know? A lot. Yeah, I heard some of y'all saying that. Finances. Don't tell me what to do with money. Well, the Bible does. Here's a taboo subject in, in churches. Tithing. Isn't that funny? I said tithing, everybody goes. <laughs> All of a sudden, the, the, the gaze is broken. Oh, oh yeah, 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 it's a good subject right there. TV, movies, magazines, internet, etc. We blow it off. Is it just being entertainment? Entertainment will kill you. You know how many drug overdoses have collect lives every day? They thought that was entertainment. A stronghold is any area that we've not trusted to his complete lordship. Here's what we do. How, how I'm going to ask for some feedback tonight. How do we create a climate for God when we come together? Okay, praise and worship. That's one. Come on, how do we create a climate for God? Invoke presence, prayer. Watch this. What's prayer? What's prayer? What do you say when you pray? We give him thanks for what he has done. What? Pray in tongues. What else? How, how do we provide an atmosphere for God? Tell him how much. Okay, watch this. How do you prepare a romantic date for your wife or husband or whatever? Plan it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You put it on the calendar and you mark out that time slot. I'm protecting this time slot. You want to know why the house of God is not really full? Because people didn't put it on the calendar. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? Everything else, got, everything else got put in that spot. Okay? What else? When you're a romantic, romantic date with your spouse, what do you do? Go shopping. What are you going to buy? New outfit. Why do you want a new outfit? Huh? You want to look good. Do you say take a shower? Oh, flowers. Come on, what else? You, 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 want, you want time alone with your, with your spouse. What, what else does it look like? What, what, invite chocolates. Want to make sure you look good. So, so far we got looks, outfits, and a schedule. What's, I'm sorry, what was that? Give her a microphone. She's anointed right now. What was that? Get rid of interruptions and distractions. I'm, I'm going to say this out loud. If some of you are sitting behind somebody and they can't keep their little hands off each other, he's over here playing with their hair and rubbing her back and he's, she's over here playing with his ear and scratching and that, and that is getting your attention, sit in front of them. 
If somebody's got that cute little baby with the fat little cheeks and little dimples that's always looking at you and blowing little spit bubbles, and that's causing you to have a distraction, get away from them! If you know you got a bladder that's about as strong as Pee Wee Herman, please quit drinking three, uh, three things of water before you come into God's house. Just, just fast before you come into the house of God so you're not running to the bathroom 12 times. Get rid of distractions. Man, you'll turn your cell phone off. I look around here, it's 15% of you surfing Instagram and Facebook and everything else in the house. Get rid of distractions. If the person in front of you has got a cow lick and it's annoying you, lick it and put it down or move. Here's the problem. We treat church like a restaurant that everything is prepared for us when we arrive. The temperature's right, the seats are clean, the toilets have been swabbed. We have the right flavor of coffee that addresses your particular palate. We have the right flavor of sissy sauce and enough of the little stir sticks and the right kind of cups that don't burn your fingers. Church somehow shifted from all about him to all about us. If we ever made church once again all about him, he would make it all about us. But he doesn't even have the opportunity to make it all about us because we come with us on our mind instead of him on our mind. It's amazing that we don't seem to understand how to create a climate for God, yet we are experts at creating a climate for the devil. We do all the dumb stuff that we know is going to contribute to him having a foothold in our life. We go places we shouldn't go, say things we shouldn't say, do things we shouldn't do, see things we shouldn't see, be with people we shouldn't be with. Pick a job based on pay and benefits rather than whether or not that's where God wants you. Here's one. Buying a car. You buy the car that you want instead of asking God which one you should have. Oh, you thought, you thought adulthood was all about freedom, right? Yeah, freedom to pick his way instead of your own. You're right. Do you catch what I'm saying? What if you buy the car that you always wanted and you didn't know it's history? You didn't know it was used for drug running and putting dead bodies in a trunk. and You wonder why it's always breaking down and making noises and no matter how many times you get new gaskets, it's leaking oil all over your driveway. And Oh, now y'all think I'm getting super spiritual. I'll back off just a second just to make you, you feel good because obviously church is all about you, right? You catch what I'm saying? Wait, hey, listen, you can't talk about certain things behind the pulpit. Do you understand why people got upset at Jesus? You did what? You healed on, on the Sabbath? Forget the fact that he did what you couldn't do. He healed. Why are we always got to be Siskel and Ebert when it comes to the things of God? Why are we always just trying to critique and criticize and, well, it could have been done better if they just did it? Why don't we just celebrate that somebody did get healed, somebody did get saved, somebody did get filled with the Holy Spirit, somebody did get delivered of demonic activity, somebody, why, why, why does it got to be the way we think it ought to be? Listen, I found I do deliverance a lot different than some people that I know or know of. But I found they also have success. 
And I don't go, well, I don't know how they're having no success no way because they don't do it the way I do it. Listen, God honors what they're doing like he's honoring what I'm doing. I'm just trying to figure out, God, what else do you want me to put in this? Show me what else that I can be doing that will take things a little uh, a step farther, a little deeper. So when I find that somebody's had success somewhere else, yeah! Celebrate them. That really is fat, isn't it? <laughs> the Bible says, don't give the devil a foothold in your life. So if you own this tract of land, 1,000 acres, house is here, stream runs through it, And you invite me over to fish a little honey hole, you know, right there. And I'm catching fish, and you're barbecuing, and we're having a great time. You're watching all the lines fall off my face. So when the, when the cookout's over, you, you can think to yourself, listen, God's given me a 1,000 acres. I, I think I'm just going to lease one to Joel so he can come over there. He can just leave the church and bring a fishing pole in the back of his truck and, and, and fish. Until one day they found out there was an unsanctified side of me. And when I went, whenever I went to their property, I went all through the thing, man. Came in behind your house, just romped and just went all through the place, all over the place, doing donuts and four-wheeling and throwing out beer bottles, candy wrappers, spare tires, everything, just all the trash I needed, stuff that it was done at my house. I couldn't find a dumpster. Just went to the back end of your property. They'll never find it. <laughs> Shove it off. This is exactly what happens, watch this, when you try to make a friend out of the devil. When you try to make the devil your friend, he will destroy everything that God gave you. Thousand acres, you gave the devil one, but he tore up the whole place. Don't believe me? There was a season, we are now rodent-free, hallelujah, but there was a season that a couple of field mice got in this building, and I couldn't hardly find them. In fact, they waited till deliverance. <laughs> I got people in my office, and I say, look me in the eye, and all of a sudden, I see their eyes go, thwing, and I say, I don't know, man, I saw something over there. I don't know what that was. A little mouse jumping along the wall. If I just ignored that and said, oh, pff, look how big the building is. It'll be old field mouse. Until we come in here and try to have church and the sound system doesn't come on, the microphones draw staticky because they love to chew wires. And then all my snacks that you guys like to go back there and invade, you find you got little holes in them and Huh? It's a big place. Mice are so little but they can destroy an awful lot. I've told you the story. In fact, I, I preached a message about the pack rat in my life. I had a pack rat that got in my navigator back in the day. My head unit stopped working. The electronics stopped working. My truck went, what's going on? And I always pulled it in, in the garage at night, but I left the windows down. I should have had a camera in there. I really should have. Because all my shades disappeared, all of them. Must have been some cool rat. <laughs> and I noticed on my side mirror that it looked like somebody just licked their fingers and just all over the mirror. I'm like, I mean, this, this thing must have had an Elvis spirit. You know what I'm saying? Just sitting in front of the mirror. Just <laughs> but 
no doubt, when I, once I figured out what was going on, he was sitting on my, on my door and making goo-goo faces at himself in the mirror. So I figured it out when I started pulling everything out and discovering where the wires were not just broken, not burned, but chewed. And then I had all my stuff in the back. He got in a box of Cat 5 and chewed in random places throughout all that Cat 5. Got in, got in, my, in my backpack. I still got one of the backpacks where he chewed through the side of it. One rodent. Big vehicle. Just takes one little thing. So for those of you that have, well, 99% of my life is holy. But you got that 1%. Just that 1% that you just never got, gave God the key to. That 1% will ruin the 99. It will taint it. So let me give you just a handful of strongholds, and then I'm going to pray for you. First stronghold is lying. Lying. Ephesians 4.25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood. That's lying. And speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. If you're not living on impeccable truth in your life, you're creating an environment for the enemy. Lying is part of the devil's nature. John 8, 44. The devil is a liar, the Bible says, and the father of all lies. Satan is the prince of darkness, and lying is in the realm of darkness. God's kingdom is built on truth. John 14, 6, Jesus is the truth. John 17, 17, the word is truth. 1 John 5, 6, the spirit, capital S, is truth. So can you answer honestly for yourself, is there any area of your life that's not impeccably and indisputably and completely honest? Do you know that you don't have to just tell a falsehood in order to be lying? It can be a tone. It can be a tone. Some of you are like, wow, a tone? Yeah. It can be the way you answer. Hey, did you did you eat the last ding dong? Me? <laughs> it's a tone. A tone can, de can, can denote mistrust. If there's any area of your life that's not based on absolute truth, then you may be sitting here a deceiver, a hypocrite, Living a lie, telling a lie, loving a lie, prolifer proliferating a lie, and you've made an environment for the devil to be at home. Number two, anger. Anger creates a climate for sin. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry, that's fine, just don't sin while being angry. Angry is not your excuse to do bad things. We dealt with this uh, about a week and a half ago. I told you there's going to be crossover. The devil has an affinity for anger. You know how many times I've looked in the eyes of somebody who's demonized, and I'm dealing with one subject, and all of a sudden, just because I uncovered a particular area, and I speak about that, that anger comes up. You just see their, their lip starts quivering, their eyes get real glinty. And there's a, oh, oh. Anger many times is a cover for something else. Anger is a cover. Oftentimes in relationship, anger is a cover because they, they know that what you're dealing with is a truth. And so if they can just get angry, it covers the subject so that they, they back off. 
Why anger can also be mani manipulative, a manipulation tactic. That's why the enemy loves to use anger. How many cop shows have you seen where somebody robbed a bank or did something they didn't want to do because they said, if you don't, we're going to do this to your family? Anger is that type of thing. It's used to strong arm people. Thirdly, stealing. Ephesians 4, 28, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. So the devil is not just a liar filled with anger, but he's also a thief. How do you know? John 10, 10, the thief, which is the devil, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I've come that they might have life, that they may have it more abundantly. Satan is the thief. Luke 16, 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. If you're capable of stealing a little bit, you're capable of stealing a lot. I'm going to tell you this story, not to elevate me in any way, but just to tell you how much it messed with me. I went to Walmart and I was buying some stuff for the church and some of the stuff I was buying was some notebooks, some note-taking notebooks. And these notebooks were in a slot that was price A, right? It, it literally said discounted. It was a clearance thing, yellow tag. It was like a $3 savings. So I got three of them. So I went through the through the line, sure enough, it rang up full price. And I said, man, I kind of figured. So look, here it is. He looked at it and said, yep, that's what it says. So he adjusted the price. And, uh, and I went out the door. And I thought, huh, they didn't get one over on me. But something was nagging at me. So when I got in the truck, I pulled out the receipt. And I looked at the, the number of the tag that goes to the price. And then I looked at the tag, the, the serial number, whatever you want to call it, on the on the notebook and they didn't match savings I don't know somewhere around five dollars in total and I thought you know how many times that they've stuck it to me over the years this that, or this isn't even close so I started the truck and I thought ah, it, it's not that big a deal and man, I could not get away from it. It was driving me nuts. And I thought, but if I have to go back in there, then he's going to want to go back to the shelf and see that he's going to take a picture of that. He's going to bring it back. He's going to take my receipt. He's going to have to credit that back. He's, all this. I'm going, what a mess. My time is worth more than the $5. But I couldn't leave. I could, but it would have messed with me. So I went back in and I said, look. That tag doesn't match that number. Well, let's go look at it. <laughs> and then he came back and said, well, listen, because you were honest, I'm going to go ahead and discount one of them, and I'll just give you the, I'll just charge it. I said, no, just do it on all of them. I've already went through the mess. Just charge it. And when I went back to the truck, even though it cost me time, I knew I could get on with my day, whereas my day would have been robbed over five bucks if I'd have let it. If you want to know the truth, I really believe God was testing me. I do. It's only five bucks. What are you going to do? Oh, so what are you going to do? It's only five bucks. But if you can justify $5, you can justify 5000 But if you can't justify 5 bucks, you sure can't justify 5000 All right, that was free.
Malachi 3.8, will a man rob God? Yet you robbed me. But you say, in what way we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in, in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out unto you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. I know there's a teaching going on, and I have studied it. I've gone back and forth. I have have tested it. I have tried it. I have beat it up, looked at it upside down, inside out, every which way. Here's the deal. Robbing is robbing. And I have a hard time understanding how in the world I could care about whether or not Walmart got $5 if I'm not going to be concerned about whether or not God gets his 10%. Does that make sense? Matthew 5.20 says, For I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious people, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to tell you some other ways that we rob God. Money's one of them. I'm going to tell you another way. We have people that will give money as a substitute for obedience. I support the church. I'm helping you do what God's called you to do. How about you just do what God called you to do, and that will be the support of what God's called me to do. Sometimes we rob God because we're not singing. We're not dancing. We're not celebrating. We're not sharing Jesus. We're not telling the truth. We're not demonstrating authority. We're not walking in power. We walk a defeatist, scared, mamby-pamby spiritual walk, calling on everybody else to pray for us because we don't carry enough to pray for ourselves. We rob God when we don't represent who he is. We rob God when we don't do what he says do. Number four, inappropriate speech. Ephesians 4.29 says, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Unwholesome talk is faithless, Loveless words. It's words that tear people down. The only thing we ought to be tearing down is the devil's strongholds. We ought to be lifting people up. We ought to be lifting Jesus up. There's a song we used to sing, lift Jesus higher, lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see. We ought to be using our words to encourage, to strengthen, to assist, to help, not to murmur, not to complain. Not to be cross. Matthew 12, 34 says, You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Watch this. Well, I only cuss when I get mad. Think about what you just said. What was number three? Anger. If you're releasing ungodly anger, of course it's going to be coupled with profane speech. Just like when you're under the anointing of being led by God. It's accompanied by praise and worship and tongues and adoration and words of encouragement and enlightenment. All Yes! So if you're angry and you do things that are not right, you're under the influence of the enemy. But you handed him the keys. It's another environment for the enemy. One more, and then I'm going to pray for you. Bitterness. Bitterness creates a climate for the enemy. Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Did you know the devil's bitter? The devil's bitter. He is hacked. 
that he got kicked out of heaven. He is hacked. He could not overpower God. He is hacked that you're even here tonight. He is, he is fit to be tied that you're getting information that is the golden key that breaks his strongholds in your life. He is chapped with no access to chapstick. That's why the devil has a bitterness vendetta against God's people. The devil loves a bitter heart. Listen, I'm going to speak to some of you right now. Some of you don't find yourself bitter at people. You find yourself bitter at God. Because God should have healed them instead of let them die. God should have prevented that sexual abuse from happening instead of us having to cry out to him for healing and restoration because of it. Bitterness is bitterness, whether it's pointed at a person or at the Lord. Bitter people have a very difficult time receiving, accepting, or demonstrating joy of any kind. And I'm going to say this. Again, I'm working so hard to not be political, but this hacked me off when I heard this. You guys know what I mean when I say the cackle. I'm sorry, maybe you weren't paying attention. Let me go to this side. You guys do understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the cackle. And when the individual who cackles was asked why they cackled, they said, well, I'm not going to let anybody stomp out my joy. This is a campaign of joy. Can I just tell you, there's many times when people laugh, cackle, snicker, snicker, or whatever else, and it is a cover for something else. It has nothing to do with joy. Laughter can be can be an evidence of joy, but laughter by itself is not guaranteed that joy is what promotes it. Joy is something that is on the inside that is at a constant level no matter what's happening. I can be crying at a funeral and still my joy level is high. I don't have to be laughing at the funeral for joy to be alive in my life. That's why we have a lot of people at church that we think are saved and filled with the Lord because they'll do this during worship. That does not mean that you're surrendering. That means that you don't want to look standoffish and you're going to stand out from the crowd when everybody else is loving Jesus and you're sitting there going. You catch what I'm saying? So how do, we, how do we deal with this? I struggle sometimes in this, in this series, if you could even call it a series. I struggle in, in saying this so repetitiously because it, it sounds as though that there's not been study or preparation or, oh, he's just going to say those three things again. You, you want to know why? Because if I don't, then you'll fail to remember it repetition is a form of meditation that's why it was not enough in in april the 17th of 1999 that i looked at my wife on our wedding day looked her in the eyeballs and said i love you babe and that ought to carry you for the rest of our lives i have to tell her repeatedly not because she asks for it but because I need to declare it and she needs to hear it. That's why sometimes we just got to hear ourselves say, I'm righteous. I'm holy. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above, not beneath. I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm well. I'm wise beyond my years. And between my years... (laughs) We have to speak things as an affirmation, as a confirmation, as a, as, a, as a propelling agent to put wind in our sails. Words matter. Watch this. And withholding words matter. Stop telling your betrothed that you love them. Stop telling your kids that you care. Stop telling your employer that you so appreciate the opportunity to serve. Stop telling your pet that you care about them. 
It's a proven scientific fact that if you speak kindly to plants, they flourish. And if you curse them, they die. Why? They're a living being. And if it works in plants, what do you think it does to the plant in my life? That's why there's so many times when I minister to somebody, I'll have to look them right in the eyeball and say, listen, I really love you. You may not think, see, she's having a hard time not smiling right now. You, you may have a hard time believing that I even mean that and that I'm just using you as an example. But the truth of the matter is, look me in the eyeballs. Finding the lie in there. I really do love you. And you want to know why it's important for us to have to say that at church? Because a lot of times they're not getting it at home. Y'all better hear that. We're so selfish when it comes to the things of God. God, love me. Lord, tell me how much you love me. God, help me to understand and know. God, help. And he's trying to use you to help somebody else, but he can't get you to help somebody else because you're so self-involved. Three things. The first thing we do is when we find an area that's sensitive. For those that don't know, this is Dr. Muse back here. Wave at everybody, Doc. So I went into his his office the other day and uh i'd been doing some things i probably shouldn't have done and so i was i was jacked up from the neck all the way down you know what i mean and uh so i'm laying on the table and he just goes like this just going oh there's one okay snap crack crack move on down oh there's another one snap crack crack watch this he moved until he felt tenderness inflammation and something out of order so in ministry I have to look around the room and watch because I'm poking anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and and when I see people and it's not always a physical response. Sometimes it's just something I sense in, in my knower. Does that make sense? So I'm looking for inflammation. I'm looking for pain. I'm looking for something that's out of joint, out of socket. I'm looking for something that, 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 is, that is distorted from the truth. And that needs an adjustment. It's like I did that, kind of worked that in there. It's kind of pretty good. That was awesome. <laughs> So repentance is what you do when you find an area of inflammation in your life and you go, oh, that hurts. If it hurts, you got to address it. Whether it's unforgiveness, bitterness. Here's, here's a big we don't like to talk about a lot. Self-hate. Oh, I just love everybody. Self-loathing. You can't stand the way you look. You don't like your weight. You don't like your receding hairline. You don't like your hair color. You, you don't like your height. You don't like nothing about yourself. Your club feet, your weird toes, nothing. And you marvel at how beautiful everybody else is. And you look in the mirror, it's like, ugh. Self-loathing, self-hate is a real thing. Because if the enemy can get you to think about yourself the way that he thinks about you, he can get you to end your life and thus, watch this, cause a familiar spirit in your family line. It is improbable that in a group this size that there are not at least one, two, or three, could be more, in this room that are actively, actively dealing with suicide. If I could show you your family line on a chart, here's you and here's all the descendants from you. And if I showed you that if you ended your life this one, 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 this one would also end their lives because you did. Would you be as willing to do so? Here's our problem. We live our life in such a way that we think that whatever I'm dealing with is my issue and my problem and it doesn't affect anybody. Nobody even knows that I've got it until you're gone and the devil that was in your life finds another host in your family line That's why we got to deal with stuff. I'm determined that there are things that I have dealt with in my life 
that my kids will never know the taste of. Why? Because it ended with me. Amen. You catch what I'm saying? But it, it, it takes more than just a, well, I think I'm going to try to make that happen. No, you have to be absolutely determined. And you've got to be willing to allow those parts of you to die. So when you find an area that's inflamed, out of whack, you have to repent for giving that permission in your life because there's no influence that is in your life that you didn't give authorization to. Secondly, once it's repented of, once the repentance takes place, now that enemy is a trespasser. Before, they were renting. But when you repented, you filed the proper paperwork with the Lord, and they went from being a renter to being a trespasser. So then you have to go speak to the enemy that you said, yeah, I know I told you you could live here. <laughs> well, I changed my mind. Beat it. And once the enemy's gone, the third thing is, you say, Holy Spirit, that area that I, I gave the enemy to live in, I've evicted them out of my life, but I want you now to live in that area. So I'm asking you to make it yours. You want to clean, mop, disinfect, plug holes, hang new pictures, rearrange the furniture, put new furniture in, replace the floor. It's yours to do with as you please. That's why you and I, as long as we draw breath, are a work in progress. And we come next week, and the next week people are going, I don't, what's, what's going on with you? And you say, well, I don't know. What do you mean what's going on? I don't know. There's something different about you. What's different about you? And you start thinking, well, did I color my hair? Did I do my nails? Is it different makeup? And it has nothing to do with that. What's happening is it's, it's God doing something on the inside, and that the work that he's doing on the inside is now reflecting on the outside, and people are beginning to identify that there's something different with your house. Here's another one. <laughs> Some of you think that because you don't allow it in your life, it's okay that you allow it in your house. I need you to hear that if you've allowed it in your house, you've effectively allowed it in your life. Well, just because I invited so-and-so over and I didn't want to be rude to them. And so, you know, they've got a car and they can legally smoke, you know, marijuana. They might legally by law smoke it. But they don't have to legally smoke it in your house. Oh, I'm sorry. Did that offend you? Repeat this after me. You see what I'm saying? Well, well, I invited them over, and they brought this movie, and I didn't have any others, and so we just went ahead and played it. Freddie on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. Gremlins. Who just laughed? You watch it, you probably own it. Get it out of your house. Watch this. When you relegate a demonic entity into a Furby or a little gremlin, then all of a sudden you've made, you have made an environment for the devil to live. Ah, all right. Let's deal with a couple so we can say we did. And then we'll see what hurts. Let me do this. I'm not going to air all your stuff. If you caught any part of this broadcast, God bless you. hope you learned something. If you're looking for a church home, we're looking to grow the family, especially on Thursday nights. We're a little light tonight on Thursday nights. 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. 2 p.m. every Sunday afternoon, 645 p.m. on Thursday evenings. We look forward to seeing you. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.